name, amen. You may be seated. All right, before we get started this morning, uh, excited we have with us uh, uh, Brother McDaniels and his family, uh, their missionaries with us. Brother Houston had asked him to come uh, to fill the pulpit because he didn't know I was going to be here by this time, and so he texted me. I think a week and a half ago and he goes I forgot <laughs> he says I had asked uh, this missionary to come and so I said well we'd still would love to have him and, and be with us and so they're here if you saw on the back there they're uh, missionaries to the Navajo uh, Indian Reservation uh, they're in Arizona and uh, and all that they're going to do there it's exciting I, I've known a missionary to the Navajos brother Chitty uh, he's in New Mexico and, uh, and then my wife knows a missionary, uh, Brother Mark Haynes, and they know both very well. And so it's, it's neat to, and there's not very many missionaries, uh, to number one, to Native Americans, and there's not very many missionaries to the Navajos. And uh, it's really neat. I'm excited for them to uh, get to present their work. If you've never seen uh, or know much about the Navajos, uh, take some time, ask questions, go back there, look at the, the booth and, and things. They uh, are a needy people. Let me tell you, I've been to the reservation, and uh, wow. Wow, what a uh, what a work is out there. Uh, Brother Chitty talks uh, showed us around and what the the people live in and just uh, just it it's amazing to see. And so you know you uh, take some time, ask questions, amen. But I'm excited. They're going to share with us in Sunday school uh, their testimony. We get to meet their family. The Sunday morning service we're going to watch a, a presentation. If you've never seen like a missionary presentation, uh, it's exciting. So we'll get to see that in the Sunday morning service. But for the Sunday school hour, we get to meet them. Get to uh, he's going to introduce his family to us, give us a little bit of their testimony, and then uh, we'll uh, have the Sunday school and then in the morning service get to hear more. Tonight he's going to preach to us amen so make sure you're back uh, i love to get to hear missionaries preach and uh, every time a missionary preaches i surrender the mission field but the lord makes me stay so uh but it's, let the lord stir your heart about missions today uh, just about what god can do and uh we want to reach hutchinson amen but there's uh, other parts of the world that still need to be reached as well or hutchinson wichita wow like i said brother i haven't been here very long so i'm just uh, thank you i'm sorry Wichita, amen. We want to reach Hutchinson too, but leave that to Pastor Haley. I'm in Wichita, amen. And I got to go soul winning yesterday, got to see one saved, and uh, went soul winning on Friday and tried to knock some more doors and uh, have a man supposed to be here this morning. So I'm going to call him after Sunday school and say, hey, come on, amen. Hey, he was from Gambia, Africa. So I didn't know in Wichita, I mean, people from everywhere. So I'm excited. So, you know, but he got saved, supposed to be here this morning, and uh, he's going to be a missionary by the time he's done. He doesn't know it, but he's going to end up being a missionary. So. No, I'm just kidding. But praise the Lord. So I'm excited. I'm going to have Brother McDaniel come and share with us a little bit this morning. And uh, I'm excited. So let's give him a hand. We are the McDaniel family. My name is John McDaniel. It's my wife, April. If you stand up. It's my wife, April, my, my son, David, and my daughter, Alex. We're missionaries going to the Navajo Indian Reservation. Uh, you'll see a little bit more about it in our video presentation, but it's if you didn't know, it's the it's in the states of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. I was talking to Brother Daryl. He, he was he said, "What country are you from?" And I said, "I'm from I'm from the United States of America." And he said, "No, what country are you gonna be going to?" And I said, "Well, see if you can figure it out by looking at our display." And he, he didn't get back to me, but Brother Brother Daryl, we're we're going to United States of America, to the Navajo Navajo Nation. So we're gonna be in the same country, but going to a specific people group. The Navajo Nation, you know, I thought that the word nation meant countries. When I read it, it said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. I thought, okay, we need to go to every country, you know. But that word nation means people. It means it's where you get the word ethnicity. And so we need to reach every ethnicity. Every, every, per, every person needs to be able to hear the gospel. I don't want to get too much into my message, you know. <laughs> but uh, we need to be able to reach all people. And, uh, and um, one of the people that is unreached, is the Navajo Nation. It's the largest Indian reservation in the United States. It's 27,000 square miles. So that's roughly the size of West Virginia. So we have a, we have a reservation here roughly the size of another state. It's larger than 10 of the smaller states. And only a handful of churches there, maybe, maybe 20 to 30 churches. So at, with, with 110 communities and only 20 to 30 churches, that tells me there's a lot of communities that don't have a church. So where are they going to go? And where are they going to go like you guys and, and fellowship and hear preaching? And they don't have, they're going to have to drive a long ways. Some people have to drive 50 miles or more. It's kind of like the state of Kansas. 
There's a lot of communities here in Kansas that don't have churches. And it's a very, the reservation reminds me, uh, Kansas reminds me of our reservation in the sense. Now, the one difference between Kansas and the Navajo reservation is that, you know, you have paved roads and you have electricity and, you know, it's a little bit more rural. Um, and a, a pastor's been there before. It's a little bit different. Um, I'll have my wife give her testimony and she can talk to you a little bit about what it's like to grow up and live on the reservation. Hi, my name's April. Um, I did grow up on the reservation, like my husband had said. Um, I grew up in a pastor's home where this year my dad had, would, it'll be 29 years he's been pastoring. Uh, at the age of five, I accepted Christ as my savior, and the Lord gave me a desire to be a missionary or a pastor's wife as a little girl. So as a five-year-old, I would, that's what I wanted to do. And I attended the, uh, the tribal schooling on the reservation. The tribal schooling is the school on the reservation. It's, it's a public school. But instead of learning what you would learn in your high school out, off the reservation, we learned about the Navajo traditions, the Navajo culture, how to say your prayers and how to do your ceremonial stuff. That's what we would learn. And at the age of five, I'd come home singing songs to Navajo and say, oh, look what I learned. I had no idea what they meant. So I, under, I didn't understand the meaning. And my dad would have to try to tell me not to sing those songs because it's a prayer song. And you, obviously, we're not, it's not praying to God. And just get me to unlearn everything I had just spent those eight hours learning. So that I struggled with that, and also just the peer pressure for, and the, just being bullied because I had a different belief. I am Navajo, and I did go to a school full of other Navajos, but I was different in the sense that my dad was a pastor. We practiced the Bible. We didn't practice the tradition. And because of that, we were made fun of. Um, my freshman year of high school, I was supposed to start my freshman year of high school, and I finally told my parents, I said, no, I'm not going, to, I'm not going back to the, I'm not going back to the schooling. I'm not going back to the schooling. Either you put me in a Christian school, or I'm not going back. And about, on the reservation, about 50% of high schoolers actually graduate. The rest just drop out. And of the 50% who do graduate, only seven go on to college and graduate. So um, the education is... Um, lacking on the reservation just a lot of dropouts which is very sad and i told my parents i'm not going back so i figured i'd probably become one of those st statistics but during that year my dad made me work he said if you're not going to go to school you are going to work and boy did he make me um i couldn't sleep in and he i mean he just you name it he had me do it you know he had me dig a hole just to fill it back up and he'd find something for me to do and by the end of that year, I was like, Lord, I'm ready to go back to school. Uh, the Lord answered our prayers, and I began attending a Christian school 52 miles away. So for, every, for four years, my parents drove me 52 miles, dropped me off at school, drove 52 miles back home. In the evening, they'd do the same thing, pick me up and take me home. And that's, what, 208 miles in one day just driving me to school. And that's not even including the errands they had to run. And to do errands on the reservation, you have to leave the reservation. So they would drive off the reservation to do their errands. And I'm so glad that they did that because it was during my high school years, I surrendered to the Lord my sophomore year, and I actually learned of Bible college. To me, that was a foreign concept. On the reservation, if you graduate, then you just get married and have kids, or you just have kids without getting married. That's just the mindset. That's just the thinking. And so I never thought of Bible college, you know. And so when I heard of it, I, I must attend, I thought to myself. And that's where I ended up meeting my husband. We fell in love, and... I'm so glad that one thing I told the Lord, when I started to be a missionary, the one thing I told the Lord, I said, send me anywhere. I'll go wherever you want me to go. But one thing I said, do not send me back to the Navajo people. <laughs> um, you never say never because my mom tried warning me. I was so close to the Navajo people because I, saw, I lived among them. I didn't consider it a mission field. I didn't consider them as, they're just mean and, and they're not the friendliest. It's just the culture is kind of rude. Um, but don't take it personal. And um, when I left for college and I come back and visit my parents, it was the first time I actually saw there were a need there. I thought for the first time I saw, you know what, the Navajos need Jesus just as much as anybody else. And the Lord began to break my heart. And I thought, okay, Lord, there's so many kids running around on the reservation. And why don't we have like a VBS? No one wants to work. The, we definitely, the Navajos are definitely unreached, not unreachable, but no one is making an effort to tell them about the tell them about the gospel about Jesus and so the Lord burned in my heart and I surrendered and I said okay Lord I don't want to go anywhere else me. I only want to go back to the reservation it's funny how that changes and um, 
Oh, I told my mom, um, this was in high school. I told her mom, I said, I feel that the Lord was calling me to be a missionary. And she was so excited. She didn't discourage me. She, she, she was just so happy. She said, well, that's wonderful. Do you know where you want to go? And uh, this is when, when I was still in high school. And I said, oh, any place but here. And she looked at me. She said, sweetheart, you never say never. And defiant as I am, I looked her straight eyeball to eyeball. And I said, mom, I'm never coming back here. I said, over my dead body. And I even went a little further than that. I said, I will die first before I come back to this reservation. I'll, I will visit you, but no way am I coming back here. And I remember she just looked at me like, did those words just come out of my mouth? My mouth? And she just didn't know what to see. She only said, um, I'll see you in a few years. And, you know, she was right. And I, I laugh about that now because... Only God could change your heart, you know. Yeah. And my mom had said she would never go back to the reservation and look where she's at now. She's still on the reservation. <laughs> so she was trying to give me her words of wisdom. Um, the Navajos have a different set of beliefs. Uh, they don't just, they believe in being in harmony with nature and being one with the earth. Um, people get sick because they're off balance in their life somewhere. Um, everything's sacred. There's a meaning, there's, um, there's a, everything has a meaning behind it. Uh, why do you tie uh, something three times? Well, because three represents, or four times, because four represents, you know, blah, 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 stuff like that. And one of the things that we, we, they believe is if you're driving down the road on the reservation and a coyote runs across in front of you, you are to immediately pull over because that they, they, it's that, they believe that coyote is warning you of something bad going to happen. So, I mean, we see coyotes every day, you know. Sometimes I almost hit one, too. Uh, but uh, anyways, um, they believe that, that coyote's warning you of something bad going to happen. So you pull over and you let the person behind you go in front because they did, that warning was for you, not for them. So, as the, so the person behind is not going to get the bad warning because that warning was supposed to be for you. That's what they believe. Well, on the reservation, it could be a while before someone passes you. You could be the only car on the road. So they said, okay, you know. You don't want to just be stuck in the middle of nowhere. So what they do is they, um, Navajos believe corn is the essence of life. So when you go to the reservation, you'll see a lot of corn fields, if, if you do see them. And they grind it up into like powder, like fine, fine baby powder. And they sprinkle it toward the sun, um, which is where, um, not toward the sun, toward the east, I'm sorry. Because most of the time, that's where the sun rises. You know. And... Um, they say a prayer and they put their faith in that corn pollen that the corn pollen will cancel out whatever bad thing that coyote was trying to warn them of. And we see coyotes all the time, but that's what they believe. And if you could just get, they put their faith in that corn pollen, but yet they just need to put their faith in Christ to, you know, keep them safe. So please pray for us. We definitely are excited to be going back. Um, there's a lot more I could say, but another time perhaps. Perhaps uh, we'll have a question and answer time, and then you can go down. It's uh, just a, I want my wife to kind of illustrate some of the things that happen. Uh, there's a lot of superstition and things that you would laugh at, like you're going to pull over because a coyote crossed the road? Like, okay, that's different, you know. But there's a lot of things like that. Even, in our, even though there are people there, they're, they're American citizens, they're in our country, it's a completely different culture, it's a completely different way of thinking, and it's a, it's a different people. And so we ha what we're, where we're going to, essentially, is like going to foreign missions in our own country. Um, there's not a church that I know of on the re that's inside the reservation that a, uh, a missionary gets there or a church, you want to say a church planner gets there, and then three years later the church is up and running and self-supported. That's not the way it goes. The, un the unemployment on the reservation is roughly 50%. And the people are, um, that do have money, the, the, uh, the average household is below, below the poverty level. And so it's just a different, uh, it's a different culture. It's different everything. And it, here I grew up in Los Angeles in a city, the completely opposite of where my wife grew up in New Mexico. And we're going to be starting off in New Mexico, uh, 42 miles north of Gallup, New Mexico, in between, in between Gallup and Shiprock. And if you want to see a map, we have a map in the back. We can show you where it's at. Um, it's completely di different. Uh, I, I mean, I woke up as a little kid, and I turned the lights on, hit the light switch, and the light comes on. My wife, my wife, until she was 11 years old, didn't have electricity. And so and when, they, when they needed water, you go out to the pump and start pumping water. And I understand that there's some people in Kansas that still live pretty 
rule like that out here, you know. So I think there was some you could relate to, but I, I couldn't relate to that. I, I had no I, idea. Um, and so my first time ever on the reservation was when we got married. Her dad, we went, got married at our, at her, her home church, the church we're going to be going to. And uh, I was just like, wow. It's like, well, how come you don't have carpet? You know, I started asking questions. Well, I was like, stop asking all these questions. Um, I was like, why don't you have carpet? She's like, well, we have cement floors, and that's nicer than dirt floors, you know. I was thinking, yeah, I guess that's the point. You know? It's just uh, so many things are just different. It's just a different culture. And, and as we were driving away from the reservation, I just, uh, to go on our honeymoon, I grabbed my wife's hand, and I looked at her, and I'm sure I was trying to look down the road because we're driving, but there's not anyone else on the road. And I'm like, I think the Lord wants us here. I was holding her hand, and I started to tear up in my eyes, but I said, but I don't want to make a decision on an emotional whim because here we just got married. We're leaving our family behind, and maybe it's, maybe it's just my emotions. And so I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to just, uh, I wanted to know for sure it was God's calling and not my emotions. And so we, we prayed about it, and the Lord slowly began leading us back to the reservation. Now, we were living in Lancaster, California. And the, the Lord allowed us to get a job transfer, and we were then uh, living in Mesa, Arizona, where I, I was able to be a ministry intern for three years. I also became a deacon afterwards and um, got some ministry experience, um, hands-on, you know, hands-on training. And while we were serving there in Mesa, I kind of got kind of liked living in Mesa, Arizona. I liked that the cost of living was lower. You know, um, I liked the you know, conservative, poly, you know, living from California, going to, from California to Arizona is very, very, very liberal to very conservative and very pro-gun state. So I, I liked that. And I liked just my church. I liked where we lived. It was very, it was very comfortable and very convenient. We lived about five minutes away from our church and about maybe seven or maybe about 10 minutes away from work. And I was like, man, this is, this is the perfect place. I want to live here forever. <laughs> I got comfortable, and I, and I was content to stay there. I mean, I, I was ready to just to plant some roots. You know, We even tried to buy a home there, but the Lord closed the doors. And I believe that's the reason why is because God called us to be missionaries. While we were, um, while we were in Arizona, we, we went through some trials. Uh, April's she's the youngest she's the they call her the golden child because <laughs> she's the she's the baby of the family and her parents really love her and spoil her and but she has older siblings she has uh, two older sisters and a brother her brother is the next um, closest to her in age he uh, he's about two years older than me and uh, he served in the military he was an uh, uh, army veteran and he was a tank commander and he survived going through Iraq and, um, you know, almost losing his life several times in battle. But when he came back to the United States, as he was driving his motorcycle in Mesa, where we, where we were living, uh, an 83-year-old 80, lady uh, pulled out in front of him, making a left-hand turn, crossing traffic. And she didn't see him coming, and uh, he struck her vehicle, and he was ejected off of the motorcycle, and he died that, that day. That was in uh, December of uh, 2011, and that shook us up. That really, uh, wow, we, you know, you think that trials are always for other people's families, you know, <laughs> but th they can come right to your family too. And that was an unexpected death, and um, that really shook me up. He was uh, my brother-in-law was my best man at my wedding, and we were really getting close. And uh, it was just disappointing to see him just die all all of a sudden. So his funeral was at our at our sending church, and then our pastor he was gracious, and he drove all the way out to the reservation, five and a half hours to do another funeral um, and bury him on the reservation there. So the Lord was bringing us back to the reservation for this funeral, and it was amazing. I never have been to a funeral before where you were actually like ex excited and encouraged. It was like a revival meeting. My, I don't know, the Lord just gave my pastor great liberty to preach, and it was like, I don't know how to explain it, other than it was like a revival meeting. I mean, people were shouting. It was just, it was, people were saying amen, and I was encouraged, and I was excited, and, um, and, man, it was just the Lord bringing us back to the reservation again. And then we had another uh, thing happen where April's dad had a heart attack, and he almost died. Uh, it's a miracle that he lived. Uh, he, was, he had a heart, heart attack for many hours. They didn't know what – he went to the hospital. They sent him home. They were going to send him home, but my mother-in-law said, no, there's something wrong. Uh, try something else. And they figured out he was having a heart attack after, like, several hours. And they had to air vac him all the way out. They were going to send him to Albuquerque, New Mexico. But they, I said, I asked, hey, can you send him to Mesa? There's a heart hospital here. And the family's not far away. And it was like a mile away from our house, the heart hospital. So it's, they, they ended up 
praise the Lord, the, the, the tribe took care of his medical costs and flew him out to Arizona. Because you can you imagine being airlifted from New Mexico to Arizona, how much that would cost. And, and praise the Lord that, you know, they put a stint in his heart and he was, he was not killed, but he was a close call. And again, the Lord's showing us, you know, life short, you know. Uh, um, that was two months after her brother died. You know, that was, you know, that was, he died in December, and then, like, in February, you know, he, he uh, his, her dad had a heart attack. Then in um, April, we had a child that was born in Gallup, New Mexico, right, off, right outside the reservation. April was visiting her mom and dad. And our, 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 our middle child that's in between David and Alex uh, was born and lived for about 20 minutes. And uh, our son Aaron passed away on the same day he was born. And that was on April 15th of, uh, of I believe, of 2012. Wow. Uh, another funeral on the reservation again. You know? uh, we buried our son. My wife is a faithful woman. I, can, I can't um, speak highly enough of her. You know, she, our son was born on, around midnight on Sunday morning. And then on, at 7 o'clock, they let us leave the hospital. And we, we went to church. And we buried our son in between the church services. We went back, we went back to church Sunday night. And uh, my father-in-law helped me to build a, um, what do you call it, a, a casket. A wooden, we, we just used, the, um, we, he has wood around his house, so we just put together a casket for him, put his name on it, and we buried him right next to her brother. And, you know, we put up a cross and put his name on it, you know, and a wooden cross, kind of like an old-fashioned, like a cowboy grave, you know. <laughs> And we took pictures of it, put us posted on Facebook. We were happy with the cross, with his name on it. We thought it looked nice. We had some of our friends say, though, why can't you do something nicer for your son? Um, couldn't you get, like, a gravestone? I was thinking, man, we don't have the money for that. You know, it was, uh, but you know what, they were, like, but I was kind of a, kind of hurt by that. Well, couldn't you do something nicer? I thought we did something nice. You know, I thought it was nice as we could do. But our friends allowed us to, to they, they collected money for us, and we bought a gravestone for our son that passed away. And I believe that you should honor life, you know. Even though that baby lived for 20 minutes, it's a, it's a human life. And so we, we put a, by the grace of God, we were able to put up a, a nice headstone for him that, the, that we didn't pay for ourselves. As other Christians and other people, our friends and family did that for us. And when, when, we, when we put that gravestone in place, uh, we, it took several months for it to be built and to be made. It was about in August, uh, August of 2012. We took the headstone uh, all the way up to the reservation, and we wanted to put it in place. My father-in-law was having a revival meeting at the church, and he asked me if I'd preach. He, I was already going to be there to, to put the headstone in for my son. And so my, my pastor and I, we both went up to the reservation, and, and it was like a revival meeting, but it was, only like <laughs> it was really only April's dad. It was me. It was just a few people there, my pastor. And it was like we were taking turns preaching to, our, to each other. Her dad pre- would preach, then I would preach, then my pastor would preach. And it was like a, everyone else didn't show up. I don't know what happened, but it was like a personal revival, you know. The Lord began to work in my heart to be a missionary to the Navajos. I think the Lord kept bringing me back to the reservation and showing me, hey, this is where I want you. And during this, re- we had this revival meeting at my father-in-law's church. That's the church we're going to be going to, Nassau Baptist Church. And my pastor had to leave because they, ha- they were having a revival at his church. They had an evangelist come in, evangelist Mark Rogers. And so I ended up leaving. Uh, I had to go back to work. And so I went, back to our, I went back to our sending church, East Mesa Baptist Church in Arizona. And uh, every night of the revival meeting where evangelist Mark Rogers was preaching, I, was, I knew God was calling me to be a missionary to the Navajo Indians. Uh, Monday night, I was under conviction. I wanted to go for it, but I was like, but I have, but what about this? What about my finances? I still owe some money in my credit cards. Or, or what about, you know, I need to finish Bible college. And I, I had all these, what if, what about this? I had all these re- reservations about going to the reservation. <laughs> but God showed me that if you just trust me, I will take care of those things. I think about the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And finally, on Wednesday night of the revival meeting, I, I just said, all right, Lord, I surrender. I'm going to go. I don't know how I'm going to be a missionary. I'm, I'm, I'm a white boy from Los Angeles. I feel like I'm completely the opposite of the culture there. But it doesn't matter about what I think. If you've called me, I'm going to do what you want. And so on that Wednesday night, I took my wife's hand. We went forward, and we surrendered to be missionaries. And it's amazing how when you just surrender, how God takes care of those things, just like I mentioned, 
And we I, I ended up graduating from Bible college. I was a few credits short. The Lord provided the money for me to uh, just take the, a class online. And I graduated in 2013 from West Coast Baptist College. And then in 2014, we went off to a candidate school at BIMI. We got approved. And then in, in 2015, in March, we started deputation about a, about a year ago. And we, we've raised uh, 30% of our support so far. And we're just praying that churches like this one would partner with us. And, um, and so we could get out to the mission field. And we could see lives changed and people saved and, and see a church like this one among the Navajo Indians. And uh, that's what our heart's desire is to do. You know, uh, with 110 communities, my vision is to see 110 churches. And I don't know if that will happen in my lifetime. But I'm praying that I, I could do as much as I can until Jesus comes. Now, the problem on the reservation is that the blessing of the res- one of the blessings on the reservation that we've had many faithful men there who have been there for 50 years, 40 years. Uh, even more than 50 years in some cases. There's a man there named Frank Boer who's 92 years old, and he's still serving the Lord there. So not only do we need to start new works, and that needs to, that needs to happen, but we need to replace some of the older men that have been there for many years. My father-in-law is already traveling and preaching for this man, Frank Boer. Every Tuesday, he drives 70 miles to preach for him to fill the pulpit, basically, because he's not old. He's too. It's hard for him to get up to the pulpit, literally just... Physically getting to the pulpit is, is difficult for him. And so uh, we, need, we, need, we need laborers. Uh, we, need, we need men to be serving on the Navajo reservation. And so one of the things we may have to do is to be a, what do you, what do you call a, a circuit riding preacher. That means you, you, you pastor in more than one, basically you're pastoring more than one church. And that's, that's what we're going to have to do. That's the only way we're going to see more churches started. Because if, at the rate we're going now, it's just like it, there's just people that are not being reached. There's no church. There, there's, no, there's nothing for them. They're going to have to drive 100 miles or so to go to church. I don't know too many lost people are going to drive 100 miles to go to church. And so uh, we have to bring church to them. And so if you, we're just praying that uh, you would consider uh, partnering with us in the future as the Lord provides for you guys. And we'll send you our prayer letter. And if you have any questions, we'd love to answer any questions you have. I'm not sure what is it the time for the next service. Okay. Do it tonight? Okay. Thanks, Jim. All right. Yeah, if you, uh, we'll do some time for questions. Maybe you have some more that you'd like to ask. We'll do some of that tonight as well. He's going to be with us again tonight, but uh, praise the Lord. Amen. So I'm ex- uh, let me get this here. A couple things I wrote down. Uh, oh, hey, brother. Left your Bible. No, it's all right. I was going to steal your sermon, but I figured I should preach my own. But um. You know, a couple things I wrote down uh, as I was listening to them, you know, some things. Uh, number one, uh, don't, ester- don't underestimate what God can do in the heart of your children. Amen. And uh, my wife was saved at a very early age and uh, called to, she knew the Lord wanted her to serve, for, serve full time. And amen. So don't underestimate what God can do in your children's heart. Amen. God can use, uh, the Bible says it's the faith of a child. Amen. And so constantly make sure you bring your kids to church and get them in the Word of God because God can start start stirring them at an early age. Amen. And that's what we want. We want God to stir our children at early ages. Number two, I wrote down, don't tell God what you don't want to do. <laughs> Amen. And uh, I kind of did the same. You know, for here I said, Lord, I want to stay in Hutchinson. I want to help Dad. I was, you know, comfortable. And the Lord wanted me to come somewhere else, amen. So uh, be willing to do it, amen, and uh, be willing to give God whatever it takes. I also said, remember that God has given you certain gifts, or I wrote down, I'm sorry, God has given you certain gifts for certain people, amen. God has placed each and every one of us where God wants us because He has people that He wants you to reach. And God has given you the gifts that you have to reach certain people, amen. Sometimes we, we, we wonder... What, why God has allowed certain things into our lives, and, but it's because God wants to use that to help you reach people. Amen. Always look for opportunities to give the gospel. Uh, uh, a preacher one time, he preached on divine appointments. He said, God has uh, people that He wants you outside of church, outside of the soul winning times, outside of those things. God wants you to reach those people that only you can. Yeah. Amen. And so remember that. And then also don't get comfortable. Any one of us in this room, God could make, maybe ask today to be a missionary. God could ask any one of us, amen. God's not limited to our age. God's not limited to our financial situation. God could ask any one of us in this room today to leave and go be a missionary to the Navajos, amen. 
We just have to be willing. Amen. And uh, sometimes we think, well, being a missionary is for you know the, the the young Bible college student that's just getting ready to graduate. And you know, I'm a I, I'm here. I've got a home. I've got a family. God could God could call you right now. Amen. I've known missionaries that surrendered. They were uh, in their late fifties. Uh, personal friends of mine that they said, you know, I never thought God wanted to be a missionary, but God asked me to. You never know, amen? So be willing, amen? So praise the Lord. I'm excited. All right, well, we're going to real quick, and uh, this will be the fastest Sunday school lesson you've ever seen, amen? But Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Acts chapter 5, but it was good, amen? I was enjoying, amen, learning and uh, get to uh, hear the heart of missionaries, amen, and uh, get to be encouraged, amen? Acts chapter 5, I'm just going to give you some uh, brief, uh, just a just a brief Sunday school lesson, what the Lord gave me this last week. But Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through, we're going to start in verse 1. The Bible says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. For the last couple of Sunday schools, we've been learning about characters in the New Testament. Uh, people uh, in the New Testament uh, that we can learn from. We started about Barnabas, uh, how that he was just a simple layman doing a work for God. Amen. And we talked some different, and some different characters. This week, I'd like to show us about a husband and wife, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, a husband and wife here that was in the early church. Uh, the the day of Pente- uh, the day of Pentecost has just come, and all of and all of these things, exciting things, were happening in the church. Miracles were being done. Uh, if you look, when we talked about Barnabas, we looked at uh, Acts four, verse thirty six and thirty seven. How that Barnabas was one of those that he sold everything, sold he had, gave it to the Lord, and just. Uh, just a lot is being done in this early church. And Ananias and Sapphira got to be a part of that. It was a husband and wife. Uh, the Bible doesn't say they had any children. So we believe just a couple. That, and I don't know what age. I don't know how old, young, old. Uh, God just says it was him and his wife. And they got to be a part of all the excitement going on in the early church. But the difference was for them, we'll find, is that they did not have the same heart that everybody else had. They, were, they got to see the work of God, but they did not get to experience the work of God like everybody else did. Look there, it says that Ananias and Sapphira and his wife sold a possession. So they saw what everybody else was doing, and they said, well, we need to do that. But they made a spiritual decision whether two things that I'm not sure, uh, the Bible doesn't, is not as clear on, but either two things. Either number one, they did it because everybody else was doing it, or the Holy Spirit did tell them to sell it, and they just didn't obey completely. But there's always those types of Christians where we have to be careful that if we make a spiritual decision, we don't do it because everybody else is doing it. Amen. You've met sometimes where people, uh, young people go forward and make a profession of faith because, well, everybody else did. You know? Or sometimes we make a spiritual decision, but we don't follow through. Because there, verse 2, it says, they, or verse 1, it says, they sold a possession and kept back part of the price. So you see what happened was they sold whatever possession it was. We believe it was land because it talks a little bit later. Uh, in the, uh, uh, verse 3, Peter says at the end to keep back part of the price of the land. So we, see, we, we think the possession was a portion of land that they had that they sold. But they sold it and then they kept back part of the price. Well, what's the big deal of keeping back part of the price? Maybe they had some debts to pay. Maybe they wanted to be debt free maybe they wanted to take care of their family but the the principle is that God asked them to sell all of it but they and they committed to the Lord to sell all of it and give it to God the big deal is not that maybe they needed to take care of their family the big deal was they did not give everything they committed to the Lord and that's why God dealt so harshly, as we'll see with Ananias and Sapphira, because they committed to God and made a promise. Because look there, verse 3, Peter said, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? They lied to God. They committed and made a promise to God and then lied. Amen. And that's why God dealt so harshly. Not because God is a, is a mean God and wants everything that you have and, and is a dictator. No, but God says when you make a commitment to Him, God expects you to keep it. Amen. Amen. God expects us to keep our promises. When we commit to the Lord about giving, God expects us to give, whatever it may be. Uh, my wife and I have committed to the Lord to give uh, to Faith Promise Missions. And we've done that at our home church, and we do that here. Because I committed to God to give a certain amount. And I, I'm not going to lie to the Holy Spirit. When I vow to God, I keep that promise. A lot of times we, we make a promise to God, but we think, well, God will be okay if I don't keep that promise. 
But God says here that he, uh, that he wasn't happy. And so we see, so Peter, and Peter says to Ananias, because this is what happened. Uh, verse 2, they kept back part of the price, and his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So both of them together made an agreement, according to God's word, to not tell and to keep back part of the price. So the husband and wife agreed together. Now, it just says that his wife was privy to it. That means she knew about it. She may not have agreed, but she knew about it. I mean, and I believe a principle we ought to learn is, in our lives, we have to keep each other in check. And we cannot be afraid to stand up and say what's right. Amen. If somebody's in the wrong, and you know that's wrong, don't be afraid to stand up and say something about it. Amen. If somebody is getting ready to do something, amen, be, don't be afraid to stand up for righteousness, amen. I believe that maybe, maybe Sapphira could have saved both her and her husband's life as she would have said, honey, that's not right. We need right. to give it all. Right. But both of them, because whether she was privy to it or not and whether she agreed with it or not, we don't know. But because they both made an agreement to lie to the Holy Spirit, God took both of their lives. Amen. We have to be willing to stand up for righteousness. Be willing to say, hey, if we commit to give all, we need to give it all to the Lord. Husband and wives have to work together to serve the Lord, and we keep each other in check. I know my wife helps right. keep me in check. Yeah. I don't know what I'd do without her. <laughs> Amen. So, and then verse 3, And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Remember this, you can do what you want to, but God knows your heart. And God will tell the man of God your heart. Right. Listen to me. God will tell the Holy Spirit. God will t through the Holy Spirit. God will tell the man of God what is going on on the inside. You think I'm crazy, but you look through the Scripture, and everywhere through Scripture, God uses the man of God, whether even the man of God sometimes knows it, to deal with what's going on in the church. Amen. You can't hide. You can hide from me but you can't hide from God. And remember that. You make a commitment to God, I may not know if you keep that commitment or not, but God does. And God will work through the man of God, amen, to deal with those, is with those issues, amen. God does it. And he says that Satan filled their heart. It's funny how that even a Christian, the sa that Satan can influence. You're not so far above that the devil can't influence your decisions. Remember that. The devil can confuse you and lie to you to even lie to the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. We have to be careful not to let that happen. Amen. Even as Christians, we can't think of ourselves so far above the rules and so far above God that we can lie to God. Amen. And then verse 4, Whiles it remained... Peter says, Was it not thine own, and after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Remember, amen, what you do for the church, what you do here, your giving, all that's done in the church is not done for me. It's not done for each other. It's done for the Lord. Amen. When they lied, they didn't lie to men. They lied to an almighty God. When you don't keep a commitment... You make a commitment and say, Lord, we're going to do this. Whatever it may be. I don't know. Whatever it may be, it may be a personal thing God's dealt with you with. But you don't make that for me and for everybody else around you. You make it to the Lord. Amen. And Peter says, you've not lied to men, but unto God. That's the seriousness of the matter. Because men can't do anything. You can lie to, to the pastor. I couldn't do anything about it. But God can. Amen. And then verse 5, And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. Don't let your life be the influence where people say that's what you shouldn't do. Amen. Ananias became one of those that the church looked at and said, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Ananias and Sapphira, they were both buried and they had their tombstones. And as everybody walked by, their life was a record of, remember not to do that. Amen. I don't want any of us in the room, amen, to become a casualty to where God has to use us to bring fear into people instead of joy, right. amen. I want to bring joy to, to, to the hearts of people, amen. I don't want my life to be one where you look at me as a pastor and say, 
That's what we don't do. <laughs> I don't want you to have to leave the church and go somewhere else and say, well, we had to leave because that's not what a church should be done. Amen. I want our church to bring joy. Amen. I want our church to be something where people can go and be helped, not be found dead and buried. And God say, that's what a church shouldn't be about. Amen. That's what I want the Lord to do. So we have to be careful. And it all starts with the heart. Because Satan filled their heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. Amen. It starts with our heart. We have to get in the work of God, get in the Word of God, and allow our heart to be stirred for the Lord. And when we make a decision, we do it completely for God. Amen. Not be halfway Christians. Amen. Give everything that we can. Amen. To the Lord. Ananias and Sapphira fell because their heart wasn't right. And they did just follow through. Amen. I believe that we can keep from doing that. But the difference is, just like there's Ananias and Sapphira's in the early church, when they even saw the day of Pentecost, they even saw the miracles that the apostles did, that only the apostles were allowed to do. Amen. They saw all of that and still lied to the Holy Spirit. That can happen even in a church today. Even amongst great churches of today, where we have the complete Word of God and the Holy Spirit moves, there can still be Ananias and Sapphira that lie to the Holy Spirit. Amen. It can be any one of us. Amen. We have to keep each other in check. Amen. And let our hearts be right before the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you.